gracias a todos por, por estar aquí, por venir a este acto en conmemoración de, de Per Albert, de su obra, de su figura. Um, si me permitís, voy a pasar al inglés, uh, visto que está planeado no solo por el, el invitado, sino también por darle un, un sabor internacional a, la, a, a este acto. So, uh, first of all, I would like to thank Jesús Marco, the Vice President for Research uh, of the Spanish Research Council, who's here uh, representing the President of the Spanish Research Council, who uh, cannot uh, make it because he's in Valencia at, at a meeting. I also would like to thank and welcome Emilio Muñoz, uh, former President of the Research Council, uh, at the time when Pere uh, came to, to Spain. Uh, also, uh, Maite Alberdi and Karma Prats, uh, former vice directors with, uh, with Per Albert. Uh, and uh, I also would like to thank the uh, uh, Friends of the Museum, uh, who uh, contributed to the uh, possibility of hosting uh, this meeting, and in particular Josefina Cabarga, the secretary of the, uh, of the society. Um, I would like also to thank all, all those who contributed with information and, and, and photographs. Uh, and without further ado, I, I would like to sort of make an introduction first, um, trying to concentrate on a few aspects of uh, uh, Pérez uh, work, and forgive me if I switch between Per Albert and Pere, because in, in Madrid people used to call him uh, Pere rather than the sort of Catalan version of the name, so apologies for that. Uh, but um, I will do an introduction about sort of some general aspects of, uh, uh, of his directorship, and then Laura Nuño uh, would uh, tell us a little bit about the uh, background, and finally Gunther Wagner uh, will uh, tell us why he thinks selection is, is not enough. Um, so first of all, uh, I would like very briefly to go over uh, Pérez's uh, uh, trajectory. Um, he was born in 54 uh, of uh, last uh, century. He first spent some time at the Museo de Zoología in Barcelona. Uh, then he did his uh, bachelor's degree at the University of Kansas. Uh, and then a PhD at the University of California, Berkeley. He then moved on to Harvard, where he was assistant professor and uh, assistant curator uh, between 1980 and 1999. And uh, at that time, he moved to Madrid and was appointed, as, as he used to sign, director and professor of the uh, uh, National Museum of, of Natural Sciences here in Madrid until uh, 1995. As you know, uh, he sort of died in 1998 uh, when he was uh, 43. Um, one thing I want to sort of mention first is um, that Pere was aware of the history of the museum and I think he sort of uh, felt painfully about this, uh, about this history and I want to mention a few things that he wrote in the prologue to this history of the uh, uh, Natural History Museum that reflects um, his perception and his feeling about this. Um, he said that the history in this book is a sad uh, history. Uh, it's a chronicle of what could have been and was not. Uh, it presents us with a panorama of lost opportunities. He emphasized that it, it's uh, sad that a center such as the National Museum of Natural Sciences has reached such a cruel and extreme state of uh, deterioration. Uh, but at the same time, it was surprising that after this long and hazardous history um, of abandonment and exploration, the institution has survived. He went on to say that uh, he hoped that the renovation of the museum that was taking uh, place at that time uh, was the beginning of an irreversible uh, new step uh, uh, marked by the appreciation for science, uh, nature, and the role of museums in, the, um, in a continuous process of social education. Um, he hoped that the history that was uh, told in these uh, uh, pages of this book uh, would never repeat itself and that splendor and achievements of science in Spain would not be based solely, solely on heroic and isolated individuals, uh, but rather that uh, there was um, a bet for a less epic and more programmed research. Um, 
so uh, with that as a general frame of mind, uh, Pere approached uh, the three main areas that are the remit of this museum uh, still today. One was exhibitions, the other one was collections, and then uh, the other one was uh, science. Not only his own science, but also science management. Uh, at the time he arrived, there was a, there was a transformation going on uh, in, in the museum, and, and we went from a period of uh, what now we call old-fashioned cases and uh, animals exhibited this way, to a renovation that took us to a more modern and, and, and different view uh, of museology. And I cannot uh, help but sort of remembering the then uh, Director General of Science at the Ministry of Education and Science, as it was called at that time, who was outraged by the fact that we were sort of uh, renting uh, from NASA this spacesuit for, uh, for this exhibition. Um, at that time, when he arrived, uh, he managed to uh, inaugurate the uh, exhibition that was prepared uh, um, um, before he arrived by the, uh, the, the previous director, Concha Saiz, uh, with the presence of the, the kings, uh, the minister of uh, uh, education and science. I, I'm sorry, you can sort of probably recognize him there. And right here on the uh, left-hand side, uh, Professor Munoz, the then president of the, of the Research Council. Uh, his interest uh, in exhibitions and uh, dissemination of science were, were broad, and he also mixed uh, science and arts in, in an unprecedented way for, for our institution. And an example of that is the fact that he uh, managed to uh, persuade Rosamund Purcell to organize an, um, um, a temporary exhibition on the nature, but at the same time leave us with this uh, legacy of this uh, Garden of Eve, Eden, which combines our sort of cultural tradition with uh, the sort of artistic uh, audacity of not only Rosamund Purcell, but also Per Albert himself. Um, with regards to collections, he had a very clear uh, vision of what collections uh, should be and should do. Um, he argued that we have to do away with the image of museum as an anachronistic institution. The collections, for him, are essential to the museum. Uh, it's a raison d'etre, but they should not be an end in themselves for Pere. Uh, he regarded collections as a unique source uh, that can add a new dimension to cutting-edge research, from molecular biology to the study of environmental problems. And I, I can say with confidence that his vision has been realized over the years, uh, because now probably the two, or two of the several big areas that we have relate to um, molecular biology used for um, uh, molecular systematics and study of biodiversity and also the impact uh, of a number of factors on, on the environment. Um, what about science management? Um, I'm not going to talk about his scientific interests and ideas because other speakers will cover that, but I would like to briefly mention some aspects of his interest in management. Uh, being a provocateur as he was, he once told me that he was not interested in management. He, I mean, for that he had the gerente, the, the sort of the administrator, but I suppose that this was one of his very many jokes because he, he got very much involved in decision making with regards to major issues that had to do with science. Um, as pointed out by Maria uh, Jose Blanco and Borja Sanchez, uh, he was responsible for developing uh, a first stage uh, in the renovation of laboratories, particularly the molecular systematics one. Um, he was involved in reorganization of divisions and departments subsequent to the merging of uh, former institutes that were separated and dedicated to different things, geology, entomology, and the museum as a, as a different uh, organization. He proposed a new institutional structure, and he saw that the patronato, the board of trustees, could have a very important role there. Um, that is something that we can discuss in detail, but I think his vision there was, was very important. He was also important um, in looking for new scientists, people he could recruit uh, in order to improve the quality of science. 
One of his uh, recruitments was Monserrat Gomendio, who eventually uh, went on to be director of this museum and many other things, as you probably know. Um, he also tried to recruit Joaquin do Pazo, but he was unsuccessful. Uh, Joaquin eventually organized the bioinformatics service at the uh, National Cancer Institute and then uh, in Valencia, the, the Prince Philip uh, bioinformatics service. But that, that could not be. One other attempt he had uh, was to recruit Osvaldo Rey. Uh, Osvaldo is, uh, is an Argentinian scientist well known for his contributions to uh, paleobiology, um, uh, cytogenetics, and evolu evolutionary biology in general. Unfortunately, although Osvaldo was willing to, to join the museum and actually, as far as I know, apply for funds and started a, a research group here, uh, he died. Um, and I mean, that, that, that dream of both Pere and and Osvaldo could not be, be realized. Um, he was a team builder, and he was very good at teams and pro promoting people becoming involved and, and delegating. Uh, here are Kama Prats and, and Maite Alberdi, who were uh, deputy directors for exhibitions and public programs. Um, and uh, Maite was at that time deputy director for research and collections. And that was an important thing. When Pere arrived, uh, co collections and research were together. And there was an important message behind that. Eventually, that, was, uh, that became separated, and, and right now, we have separate uh, divisions for, for the two things. But that debate, I think, is still, is still on, and we, we probably need to go back to that. Uh, some people in the audience may recognize themselves here. Uh, I see Pilar laughing, uh, and, uh, and others as well. Um, you see uh, Pere in the center, and Karma Prat, uh, Soraya Peña, uh, Alfonso Marra, from the ones I recognize. Uh, and, um, yeah, and uh, so that was the time when there was a lot of activities uh, related to exhibitions and so on. And uh, this uh, sort of group photo from, from the time shows us uh, a number of things, including still the old uh, institute name there, uh, who still generated a lot of friction among the, uh, the people at, at, at that time. Uh, so. Uh, it is my pleasure really to remember Pere on, on his different uh, interests. Um, uh, he, he was very keen uh, on sort of promoting people's work and stimulating people. Um, I like this particular picture because this is probably how he envisioned uh, a director of a museum today if the dinosaurs have not gone extinct. Um, uh, but uh, besides that, I think it is interesting or important not only to remember Pere for what he was or did, but also uh, think about ourselves and how we sort of uh, developed our work, our exhibitions, our collections since then, um, and uh, where we are here in part uh, due to, to his legacy. And talking about legacy, I just want to finish with a couple of things. Uh, at the time he was director, there were funds to uh, build um, an, an annex uh, in the center of uh, our courtyard, um, finishing the renovation of the exhibition areas. Uh, but there was a project that was left unfinished. Um, he had, uh, based on this proposal by Argol Architectors, the idea of constructing an annex to, uh, to house uh, collections. That, unfortunately, could not be. But we have taken up this legacy uh, with a, a well, world-renowned uh, studio of architects. And we have uh, been working for the last uh, six years to try and, and develop the project uh, in order to think of a future museum that would hopefully uh, manage to regain the entire building and um, have a good amount of space for exhibitions and uh, also have uh, a building at the back uh, that could reunite, as it was some time ago, the Residencia and the Central Campus with, uh, with us and have that building serve essentially for uh, collections and, uh, and, and research. Uh, so this is a dream. Um, some dreams come true, others don't. But I think it's important to dream in order to know at least where you might uh, want to go. So with that, um, I would like to uh, now um, introduce um, the two speakers uh, briefly. Um, first, Laura Nuno will tell us about uh, 
in what were Perez uh, view a world of opportunity within constraint. Uh, Laura is a philosopher of biology, um, and she's working on, on the history and philosophy of developmental biology and evolutionary developmental biology. She graduated in humanities. Uh, she then obtained a master's degree in biophysics at the Autonomous University of Madrid. She then obtained a PhD on the problem of organismal form in contemporary biology at the Complutense University together with uh, um, Sorbonne University. She then joined the uh, Conrad Lorenz Institute uh, in Austria as a postdoc. Then she spent time as, again as postdoc in the University of the Basque Country. And right now, unfortunately for us in Madrid, she got a, a, a senior postdoc uh, to join the group of causal uh, inference and scientific representation at the Faculty of Philosophy of the uh, Complutense uh, University. Uh, then, Gunther Wagner will tell us about, as I anticipated, why selection is not enough. Um, Professor Wagner is Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology at Yale University. He studied chemical engineering, then zoology, and then mathematical logic at the University of Vienna. He got a PhD in theoretical population genetics, and then uh, went on to work at the Max Planck Institutes in Göttingen and Tübingen, as well at the University of Göttingen. Um, he uh, worked at the University of Vienna, and then he became full professor of biology at Yale University. He was the first chair of Yale's Department of Ecology and Evolution uh, on two occasions. His uh, work uh, focuses on the evolution of complex characters. He uses both the theoretical tools of population genetics as well as experimental approaches in evolutionary developmental uh, biology. I would say very much like Pere did in, in his research. Uh, he has contributed substantially to current understanding of evolvability of complex organisms, the origin of novel characters, and uh, modularity. He has received several prizes. He's a member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the American Association for the Advancement of Science. He's fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and very recently has been elected to the National Academy of Sciences of the US of A. So, uh, it's my pleasure, really, just to uh, introduce uh, these two fantastic speakers, which uh, will give us uh, different views, uh, both on Pere and on uh, the sort of legacy of Pere's work. Well, hi, thanks a lot, uh, Eduardo. Mine won't be, really be a, a long talk. I, I would leave uh, Gunter Wagner to the protagonist. I just wanted to, to introduce a bit uh, Albert's work on evolutionary biology, since Eduardo already introduced his work in, in his very innovative work in, in methodology. As Eduardo said, I'm a philosopher of biology and actually I became a philosopher of biology after, mainly after reading Pere. Um, I was doing history of uh, 19th century morphology when I incidentally um, found out a paper uh, by, by Albert where he was uh, he was uh, talking about Colchitin experiments in, in salamanders, uh, digit formation, and at the same time he was mentioning Hegel and Geoffroy saint and Aristotle and Plato, and I was really, really enthusiastic about it and read uh, his, his whole work and, and, and decided to, to, to leave a bit the history of biology, though being conscious of the uh, historical roots of contemporary biological problems and start thinking uh, philosophically about, uh, about evolutionary, evolutionary theory. So I just want to, to introduce a bit like the, uh, some of the ver what I think are very innovative approaches, uh, conceptual approaches to, to Ivo Divo in, in, in Perez's work. So as a historian of uh, morphology, as I started, um, uh, the reason I, I, um, I found uh, Perez's work was because all his papers, all his uh, conceptual, theoretical and empirical papers, start by a deep acknowledgement of morphology, of what morphology has to say to, to evolution. And this is, not, uh, this is not trivial at all because uh, morphology has had been largely neglected uh, in the modern synthesis uh, view of evolution. It was linked uh, philosophically to essentialism, typology, anti-evolutionism, and it was only regarded like a, a very subsidiary 
discipline uh, limited to just to, to, to describe the effects of, of evolution with nothing really uh, theoretically meaningful to say about, about evolution. But Bird didn't, didn't think that way and his, the problems he tries to solve from a developmental perspective are actually the problems of morphology. So to, to say it in the words of uh, Wallace Arthur, uh, the kind of questions he was asking himself were questions such as why animals have uh, some forms and not others, why terrestrial vertebrates are tetrapods and none of them has six, eight or more members, why sometimes we find animals with two heads but we never find uh, three head animals, why certain areas of the morphous space in summary are densely populated whereas others that apparently characterize viable designs are not even occupied. So the modern synthesis um, uh, theoreticians had been reluctant to actually put these questions and consequently to, to answer them. So they were uh, implicitly answered by appealing to both common ancestry and to natural selection, but Per insisted that none of these answers was uh, enoughly satisfactory. So there were forms, homologous forms, that were that related, distantly related, uh, uh, phylogen phylogenetically speaking, um, organisms, and it was uh, so natural selection. It was weird that natural selection had not acted on them. And on the other hand, there were convergent forms, <coughs> not phylogenetically related, that served different adaptive needs. There were also teratologies, monsters. Uh, very, uh, Albert was very interested in, in understanding why this kind of forms, despite of being physiologically um, uh, unuseful, were recurrently generated in the same way. So he came back to, to the 19th century von Baer's tradition of looking at development, looking at the internal properties of organisms in order to explain the logic of the morphospace, the properties of the morphospace. And at the beginning of his career, he looked at heterochronic changes of uh, shape and, 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 and size, uh, together with uh, Stephen Jay Gould, his, uh, his collaborative work um, on heterochronic is, is still his most cited paper. But he soon realized that this approach was not enough, that it was still a very, what he, he characterized as a static uh, approach focused on final morphological outcomes and that we really need to look at the uh, developmental processes generating those forms and not only affecting uh, the, uh, the final size and shape of, of, um, of animal morphologies. So, <clears throat> So for him, what, that, that, that was what he referred to at, as uh, construction rules. So, and construction rules, developmental construction rules, crucially, were defined at a morphogenetic level. So Pere was particularly interested in understanding how organisms are generated by looking at the cell level, at the cellular level. And this was in contradiction with the mainstream genetic reductionist uh, view of uh, his time. But also of current, the current mainstream in Ibotivo were actually, uh, is, which is mainly focused on comparing gene regulatory pathways. He was against that trend. He thought, of course, genes were important but should be integrated. Um, he, their, their causal road uh, should be understood within the whole developmental uh, system. So, uh, when, when trying to understand the role of these developmental construction rules and rules and the role they had as developmental constraints in evolution, he had a very integrative approach in the uh, tradition of David Wake, uh, his, his mentor in Berkeley. Um, so he, he, he really tried to understand the role of development in evolution from very different perspectives, from both from a conceptual approach, but also from a formal approach. He tried to, well, he, he did apply together with George Oster, the tool, mathematical tools of developmental system theory to understand development and, and, and its uh, role in evolution, but also experimentally. He was a brilliant experimentalist together with Emily Gale. They did um, the first crucial experiments in order to show the role of developmental developmental constraints in evolution. And for him, developmental constraints, also he was one of the pioneers in, in rethinking the old uh, concept of homology. 
So developmental constraints in Albert's view explained, uh, explained homologous relationships. So homology in his view should be defined not only by attending at the final geometrical forms, but he defined homology as the result of shared developmental processes. And in that sense, he is together with Gunther Wagner, one of the first proponents of what uh, uh, Wagner uh, called uh, a biological uh, homology concept. But also, differently to other, um, to other, to other Ivo Divo authors or to other caricaturizations of, of developmental constraints, Albert had a very positive view of constraints that did not only explain the stability of forms, did not only limit what evolution could do, but they were also, um, gener they, they were, he understood them as generative, uh, as, as uh, capturing the generative capacities of organisms, of developmental systems. And this is how he came to a, a developmental notion of evolvability, who was also actually the, the first one in trying to understand evolvability from a developmental perspective. That is to say, what are the, what are the capacities, the developmental capacities of organisms that make them better at evolving than others? And again, evolvability has become one of the core themes in contemporary Gotivo, and, 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 and Albert's work was, uh, was essential in, in, in inaugurating this new, this new path, uh, path of thought. And in this uh, later sense, related to, to, his, um, to his view of development as a creative process and not as a, um, and not as a limiting uh, factor, of uh, natural selection, I think it's really important also to remark that um, in Albert's view, the, 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 the view he had of development was not a purely deterministic one. So development was not uh, as differently to what other, others, such as Brian Goodwin, for instance, uh, process structuralism thought. Uh, he, didn't, he didn't conceive evolution as a deterministic process determined uh, by, by the properties of developmental systems and that therefore an evodivo approach would be able to predict what would happen in the future in evolution. He really conceived evolution as the result of the interplay between randomness, determinism and contingency. He insisted that, uh, well, on the, on the one hand, uh, in his evolvability paper, he elaborated on the notion of internal selection. So selection was not only acting on final forms, but what also was also present in development uh, itself. And also, he, he insisted that the most probable forms that could be generated from a developmental perspective might not be selected. And therefore, selection could open new paths, new improbable paths that were therefore uh, unpredictable. And, 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 and that an evolutionary biologist should take um, that interplay uh, into precisely into account. So in that sense, I think um, conceptually, the, 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 the main lesson of, uh, of Perez's work, even if he, his work was mainly focused on trying to understand the role of the morphogenetic, uh, morphogenetic uh, uh, level in, in evolution, I think his, the, the main lesson was his insistence that we really should try to pursue a really integrative evolutionary biology. So, uh, so to finish the work that, in his view, the modern synthesis had not been able to 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 conclude. So we didn't. We don't only need uh, ecology. We don't only need. Uh, we also need developmental biology. We need experimental experimental embryology. We also. We also need to, to, to be conscious of the historical roots of uh, biological theoretical problems and also about the philosophical assumptions underlying scientific research. And, and I think um, Gunther Wagner belongs to this trend in, of, in evolutionary biology of trying to, to construct a truly integrative um, biology. And um, well, I think that's uh, that's all. I leave you to to develop what has happened since uh, since Pere and why he's still with us. Thank you. Okay, okay. <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak here. It's uh, really a privilege uh, to be here to honor 
uh, the memory of one of the great uh, innovators in evolutionary biology of the 20th century. Uh, per Alberg was certainly uh, you know, the <coughs> main uh, uh, um, inspiration for us who started Divo Evo in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, because he was not only, you know, broad in uh, the intellectual way that uh, that Laura has, has, has outlined, but he was uh, also, as you mentioned, uh, one who led this conceptual development into an experimental uh, uh, frame, and that, uh, you know, is, uh, you know, one of the um, uh, uh, enduring legacies of his uh, work. Now, <clears throat> what I want to do today is to first uh, give you an historical context in, in terms of its uh, um, intellectual history of how and why uh, <coughs> uh, Perez's contribution was so revolutionary as it, as it is, um, and then sort of uh, uh, lead you into two examples where we see how nowadays selection and development, or if you want uh, causal considerations of the organism itself, uh, 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 feeds into uh, modern uh, uh, research part of it my own research and part of it the research of other uh, people. Now, <clears throat> of course, the starting point for all of us uh, always is the uh, problem of how to explain in various ways uh, uh, biological uh, diversity. <clears throat> now, if you would have asked in the, somewhere in the 20th century, uh, the answer to this question uh, would have been some variety of what's now called, uh, what has been called the uh, evolutionary synthesis that sort of came together uh, uh, mid, early, mid uh, uh, 20th century uh, from uh, people working in different uh, areas, uh, Ernst Meyer in ornithology, uh, Stebbins as a botanist and uh, um, uh, Simpson as a paleontologist and uh, uh, Dobchansky as a you know, geneticist and population biologist. And uh, the term, the modern synthesis, was actually coined by Julian Huxley in this uh, 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 influential book, uh, Evolution, the Modern Synthesis. And so in terms of content, uh, the synthesis is called a synthesis because it uh, reflects the confluence of various uh, originally independent uh, research traditions uh, that consists of uh, transmission genetics that you know, came out of the Morgan tradition of, of experimental uh, genetics, population biology, and uh, systematics, in particular systematics at the lower uh, taxonomic level, species di differences, uh, and so on. Now that led uh, to a research tradition that had sort of three uh, major themes that, they, uh, that were pursued at the one hand adaptation, so the modification of the uh, organism to maximize the fitness in, in, in the natural world. Uh, the other one is speciation of how you uh, divide gene pools into independently evolving uh, units and then later in the 20th century also to uh, molecular evolution where you know the evolution of genomes and genes and uh, uh, sequences and so on. Now underlying this whole uh, area of, uh, of uh, uh, new synthesis uh, biology was sort of the uh, unifying theme of population genetic theory that you know was for instance uh, developed by Ari Fisher, Haldane, and uh, Sewell Wright in the in the U.S. And you know you could, if you ask what the core of this whole way of thinking is, it's a very abstract theory of how uh, gene frequencies are changing under the influence of natural selection, mutation, drift, uh, and, and and other factors. And you know it, it gets uh, uh, you reduce to a very strong but also very arid way of looking at biology. Now that uh, went so far that you know by the uh, time I started to think about uh, evolution as an area to uh, you know in invest my uh, career in, it became actually uh, quite arid or what some people have called the hardening of the uh, new synthesis where uh, evolution was defined by changes in fre uh, gene frequencies. Now, <clears throat> that uh, view of evolution, of course, holds some truth in it because many, if not all, maybe not all, but many evolutionary changes are uh, caused by or realized by changes in gene frequencies, but there is a huge problem there uh, because it, it, it basically um, uh, you know, factors out the organism out of biology and evolutionary biology in, in, in particular. So if you think about what kind of objects uh, biologists were 
talking about at the time and uh, felt were uh, uh, central to the enterprise. So you would talk about genes, in particular alleles, different forms of the same gene, haplotypes, uh, the connected sets of uh, genes and genotypes, and then populations. But populations and species were only conceived as sort of collections of species as a so-called so uh, gene pool. And if you think about this ontology here, there's a huge hole here, and this is where the organism should be, right? Those are the things that we originally actually study as biologists, and that totally disappeared from, from view. It was actually a non-entity. It was just, yeah. You know, um, so that then led to uh, what I would call a revolt of the zoologists, namely the revolt of those people who uh, uh, study and know and, and, and appreciate the uh, uh, beauty and the theoretical importance of, of organisms. Among them, of course, uh, uh, Perry Alberg uh, and his uh, mentor David Wake, but also Stephen Jay Gould at Harvard at the time, uh, my own uh, 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 mentor, Rupert Riedel in Vienna, Dolph Seilacher uh, in uh, Tübingen, paleontologist uh, and, 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 and Yale at the same time, and Rudy Ruff at the University of, um, of, of uh, Indiana. Uh, so what was the argument? Why were they unhappy and why would they uh, uh, sort of try to come up with a counter program or a program that would supplement uh, the uh, uh, achievements of the, of the new synthesis? I think you could... Uh, uh, summarize the, uh, uh, the argument uh, that was uh, uh, put forward is that, and I don't know whether Stephen J. Gould was actually the one who coined this uh, term, but I heard it from him the, for the first time. Maybe you can tell me who actually came up with this uh, idea, namely saying that the organism is not a ball of wax shaped by the warm hands of natural selection, meaning uh, that, you know, um, you know the point about a ball of wax is that it has no internal structure other than the uh, one that is imposed to, uh, on him from the outside and here metaphorically the natural selection impinging on the organism and just shaping it uh, uh, to its uh, uh, purposes. Uh, and so the, here is a ball of wax and here's an organism and the question is, you know, <clears throat> in what way are the two different, right? And. Uh, I will uh, try to fill out this uh, argument of why uh, it was necessary to overcome a, a view of the organism as sort of a passive uh, res recipient of the uh, blessings of, the, of, of natural selection in three uh, vignettes. Uh, one, I will uh, explain in some detail the, uh, what I consider the, 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 the founding uh, uh, paper, a pair of papers on um, an, evolution, uh, an evolutionary and experimental approach to, uh, to evolution. This is the two papers in 83 and 85 by Perry Alger, Albert and Emily Gale. Uh, then I will uh, make an, an argument that uh, an, uh, an, an, a part of evolution which should be easy to be explained just by population genetics, in fact, is much more complicated if you understand that organisms are made out of cells and so on. And then I will talk uh, somewhat about uh, evolution of mammalian pregnancy, which also turns out to be a much uh, uh, more mechanistically involved uh, uh, problem. Okay, so these are the two uh, papers, uh, one of which is more a developmental uh, paper without uh, much reference to evolution, and then uh, later the 85 paper in evolution, uh, the journal evolution, where he explains the evolutionary, biological, and uh, theoretical uh, implications of that work. So what was the, on the mind of uh, Pere when he uh, talked, uh, you know, entered into this? Uh, of course, uh, Pere was, uh, started out as an, a naturalist. He really understood and knew uh, uh, organisms, in particular salamanders and frogs. And uh, what he noted, and which you know, herpetologists knew for a long time, was that if uh, uh, digits get lost in uh, the evolution of uh, salamanders of frogs, they actually follow different trajectories. And uh, the main point here is, so this is a frog uh, uh, reduced hind limb. Uh, what you see here is the second digit, fifth digit, and what's missing is the first digit. Now in contrast, if you look at uh, 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 digit reduced salamanders, uh, the digit one and two is always there, but what's uh, missing is the, 
uh, posterior digit or the pinky number uh, five. So we have an anterior uh, loss in, in frogs, while a posterior loss in, uh, in salamanders. Now, the uh, idea, I think, that, uh, 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 that uh, Perry was realizing is that not only are these microevolutionary differences in terms of the tendencies of how the morphology is changing, but there's also a difference between the two groups in the way how limbs develop in ontogeny. And that is uh, with uh, salamanders here, the first two digits are always the ones that uh, uh, develop first, digit one and two. Um, in, 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 in embryonic development, while the more posterior digits come uh, later. In contrast uh, with uh, frogs and also with amniote limbs, the uh, limb, the digits always start to develop at with digit four, which is the ring finger, to the degree, you know, frogs have rings. Um, and then uh, developmental tendency is that the anterior digits one and two are the last ones to develop. So we thought maybe there's a relationship between these developmental differences and the macroevolutionary uh, tendencies of digit loss. And not only you know, uh, satisfied with the, this possibility, he also uh, you know, thought of a way of how to test this experimentally uh, so to support his, uh, his ideas. So here was the uh, prediction. So maybe the different uh, patterns of digit reduction are developmentally determined by the consequences of size reduction. That it is intrinsic to the way how the limbs develop and how evolution is changing these limbs that determines the outcome rather than natural selection wanting to reduce the anterior and posterior digit for some functional reasons, right? That would be sort of the uh, adaptationist uh, uh, explanation. Okay, so he thought, no, so how about we uh, treat frogs and salamander limpets with a, a chemical that decreases the amount of cells that can be built during development and then uh, look what the uh, consequences were. And here, uh, uh, to make a long story short, uh, he fully uh, 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 supported his uh, um, idea, namely that simply by reducing the number of cells that are present for the formation of the skeletal elements, um, it, it actually leads to uh, exactly those outcomes. This is a, a xenopus or a frog, and so this is the non-treated side and this is the treated side, so they have control in the same animal. Uh, and here um, you have the treated uh, uh, limb where digit one uh, is missing, and in contrast, if you do the same experiment with a salamander, uh, it is the digit five that's missing on the treated side compared to the uh, four. So this is really the first time that so ideas about macroevolution and development were put to experimental tests. To my knowledge, that was the first time, and is a is is a is a is a huge um, uh, intellectual um, uh, conceptual uh, revolution. So here to just uh, summarize this, so the idea is that here you have these different phylogenetic patterns that you can reproduce experimentally in the laboratory and thereby show that it is the developmental differences rather than functional consequences and natural selection that determine the outcome of this evolutionary change. And this is actually a, a, a subheading uh, within the discussion of this 1985 uh, paper where he said, you know, points out that uh, uh, developmental perturbations have uh, lead to morphological changes that show us that uh, genetic changes have no specificity for the morphological outcome, that morph the genetic changes are actually the ones that determine the size of the, the number of cells that are available, the morphological consequences are, uh, are then uh, following downstream so that there are no specific genes of a digit one or digit five that you know, you know, are, uh, are leading to the loss of the one digit or the other. Right? Um, so then, um, one answer of, to my uh, overarching question, why selection is not enough. In this case, natural selection does not control the morphological outcome of the limb size uh, reduction. Right? Now, let me now turn to uh, another example, uh, body size evolution in mammals uh, or in general. Uh, and uh, I am choosing this because 
even I, you know, long time ago, was using body size evolution as one of the areas in biology where natural selection actually explains everything. Um, and um, and uh, you know, sort of my argument was, you know, there are certain areas where natural selection is the dominant explanation, and other areas where you need development uh, in addition to exp explain the outcome. Now, in the meantime, I, I learned more biology, <laughs> and uh, uh, realized that even in this, uh, um, uh, you know. Uh, Example of, of, of adaptive evolution, uh, you know, it's not that simple uh, uh, as it seems. So, just to impress on you the uh, fact that you know, mammals are varying in uh, over many orders of magnitude. I think more, maybe uh, nine orders of magnitude from the smallest mammals that are uh, the size of a large insect, uh, all the way to the blue whales. Uh, it's about whatever nine uh, orders of magnitude in terms of body mass. And also, of course, in other uh, groups like reptiles, we see in uh, similar uh, huge uh, variation in the overall size of, 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 of organisms. <clears throat> okay, so as I said, body size evolution should be easy to explain. And here's the theory why, because so that's the breeder equa uh, equation, one of the central uh, 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 theoretical uh, accomplishments of population genetics, which essentially tells you that the rate of change on the left-hand side should be proportional to uh, the fa two factors. At the one hand, how strongly uh, selection wants to change something, or, yeah, wants to change, you, you all understand what I mean, um, uh, times uh, age square, which is the heritability. And the heritability is a statistical measure of how similar uh, uh, offspring is to the parents. So if the heritability is zero, uh, you know, the phenotype of the parents doesn't predict the phenotype of the, uh, of the offspring. And if there's no such correlation, natural selection can select whatever it wants, it wouldn't change the next generation's phenotype, right? So we need some non-zero heritability, and the higher the heritability, the easier this trait should be changeable, right? Uh, you can see this here with this, so the heritability is technically the slope of this uh, uh, regression between the phenotype of the parents and the phenotype of the offspring. Now if we ask, so body size, you know, is actually highly uh, 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 heritable here, just some data like uh, uh, human body height in, uh, uh, in Finnish populations, it's, you know, whatever, 80, 90 percent. It's really, really among the highest and most heritable uh, traits ever, right? Compared to cattle fertility, bull fertility is, you know, less than 10 percent, right? So body size should be eminently changeable in evolution. And obviously it is, right? Um, but if you think about it, uh, how this uh, uh, goes about, so we have, so the theory tells us heritability is high, uh, uh, selection intensity can be high, you know, because of temperature or predator pre uh, 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 pressure, and so, you know, it should be a fairly straightforward uh, explanation. So in a way, body size should be the ultimate uh, ball of wax, right? Oops, why am I, okay. So, but the question is, is this really the case? Now, let's think of it about change of body size from the organism's point of view, right? Not just as an abstract trait of, you know, centimeters, kilograms, or whatever you want to think of, and her statistical traits like heritability. We have greater body size. Uh, if you have a bigger body, you need more cells. If you need, have more cells, you need more cell divisions. If you do more cell divisions, you have more somatic mutations. If you have more somatic mutations, then you have more cancer, and uh, the end is not pleasant. Okay? So this is actually a, a, a question that people have wa wondered about in the cancer research uh, area, where uh, this has been known as uh, PTOX, uh, 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 paradox, uh, Peter's paradox, where you can actually calculate the probability that an animal of a particular size should have cancer by a certain age. You know? And if you use this uh, uh, sort of simple um, uh, probabilistic uh, model here, you can calculate that all whales, uh, uh, blue whales in this case, uh, should have colon can colorectal cancer uh, by the age of 80, but there are much older uh, animals out there, and it's actually not the case that they die. So what, what, what's, what's the problem, right? Um, 
Uh, so here we have the actual human rate and the uh, theoretical rate. The mouse, of course, because it's small and short-lived, uh, shouldn't be bothered by uh, colorectal cancer at all, unless cancer researchers artificially enforce uh, the pr uh, development of cancer in these animals. So one way of uh, thinking about it is that you know you not only need uh, uh, heritability in the body size, but you also have to evolve. Uh, uh, tumor suppressor mechanisms if you want to have an animal of a larger size. And that is one of these ideas. So cells, <clears throat> as we have learned uh, you know, over the last uh, you know, few decades, is that cells have this uh, uh, ability to grow and then also have this uh, rather pr uh, 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 enhancing uh, uh, proliferation, but on the other hand, you have also tumor suppressor mechanisms that when cells get mutated, they get activated and these cells get eliminated so that they don't uh, develop into uh, cancers. Now you could think either by increasing the number of genes that are on the suppressor side or you, uh, you, and, 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 and so on, uh, other mechanisms. It doesn't matter uh, the details because they turn out to be actually not right anyway. So one of the most famous uh, tumor suppressor genes um, uh, is uh, uh, P53, or it's now called TP53, and it is a gene uh, that gets, uh, as a protein that gets activated to become a transcription factor when there's DNA damage in the genome that activates some protein kinases that changes the protein and then it gets active and uh, 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 transcribes genes that inhibit cell cycle and make sure that these cells don't grow out of, out of hand. And uh, many cancers actually then happen if there's a mutation in P53 and therefore they cannot sort of uh, turn off proliferation when uh, something goes uh, bad. Now the interesting thing is that uh, P53 or TP53 is actually a gene that is mostly uh, present in uh, one or a few uh, copies uh, in mammals. So here is one, and this is the mammalian phylogeny, and I apologize for the lack of resolution here, um, with a few exceptions, and a really big exception, namely the elephants. The elephants have actually uh, uh, 20 uh, copies of this uh, gene. Okay, so that was uh, uh, an interesting uh, discovery, but it is actually, it turns out, it wasn't that simple either, because if you take a mouse and make additional copies of the of uh, the P53 gene, what is happening is actually that these animals are aging earlier and, and dying earlier and losing fertility early, as well as you know, uh, infertility, male infertility, where the, uh, uh, the testes de degenerate. So what's actually happening here is that you know, now you have too many P53s and uh, uh, the, all the cells are on a hair trigger and uh, by any perturbation they get sort of killed because they are afraid that it might be a... Uh, uh, so that uh, alone is also not a, uh, a solution. Now it turns out actually that uh, all of these uh, additional genes in the elephant genome that are copies of the original P53 genes are actually either pseudogenes, that means they are not functional, or they are actually truncated function, uh, 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 forms of this uh, uh, protein, in particular, they all lose this sort of right-hand side of the gene where the DNA binding domain and the nuclear localization domain uh, is in there. And there's one of them uh, that actually has been shown, this uh, gene number 12, uh, that is protective against uh, 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 cancer, uh, but it is a highly truncated gene. It actually turns out that even though this uh, uh, protein doesn't have a nuclear localization signal, you still find it in the nucleus, and that's probably because it uh, associates itself with uh, the other. So that the current model uh, is that, you know, what's probably going on is that, you know, normally you have this P53 gene under normal growth condition, the protein gets uh, uh, ubiquinated and uh, then uh, destroyed. So it's always produced and destroyed. If everything is okay, then uh, it goes this way. If there's DNA damage, this uh, uh, protein gets phosphorylated and then it regulates all kinds of, uh, of other genes. Now what seems to have happened in the elephant is that we have these uh, RTGs uh, uh, that can associate themselves with this protein here and thereby uh, protect it from uh, uh, being uh, ubiquinated and, and, and destroyed and uh, creates um, 
uh, reservoir of, of active, uh, of, of activatable uh, uh, PT53, so it's a, it's a guardian uh, uh, of this uh, protein here that then can be activated once uh, um, uh, DNA damage is de detected and is therefore more, the elephant cells are actually more uh, protected against uh, uh, cancer development because you have this additional pool of this uh, p53 gene. So it's really not trivial to make an elephant, right? You not only have to, to increase, you know, uh, growth uh, 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 hormone and, 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 and so on. In order to achieve it, you have to understand how an organism actually works. I mean, it has cells, cell divisions and uh, mutations and so on. Only if you have an um, um, you have, a, uh, you have the, the advantage, uh, advantageous effects of body size, ecological, and then you have the negative pleiotropic effects uh, at the same time, and only if you can actually uh, develop uh, innovations that deal with those uh, ple negative pleiotropic effects, you get the outcome that we observe in, in, in evolution. And uh, uh, my uh, friend Michaela, and I have uh, proposed a model uh, that sort of uh, summarizes that, that adaptive evolution should always be seen as a, uh, an interplay between the selection on a, a desired trait here and the pleiotropic effects uh, that most of them are, are, are negative. So for instance, your body size and cancer, you can only evolve higher body size if you have uh, what Michaela calls the uh, RQTLs or uh, uh, that are the ones that suppress the negative uh, uh, effects that are inevitable because organisms are organized physical uh, systems and if you, uh, you know, screw around with them, each, uh, just making them bigger, you also have to incur uh, consequences that then need to be uh, compensated, for instance, with uh, tumor suppression uh, mechanisms. Okay, another example where this way of thinking sort of uh, became central to my own uh, research is the evolution of mammalian pregnancy. And of course, pregnancy is a thing that is easily understood as something to be, you know, desirable, good idea, because you have a direct interface between the mother and the fetus where you can uh, transfer oxygen, nutrients, hormones, and so on to the, to the baby and also uh, take uh, waste products out of the baby and, and, and uh, release it through the uh, uh, kidneys of the, of, of, of the mother. Okay, so that seems to be a straightforward adaptive thing to evolve, right? And it's actually uh, uh, quite a, a good argument because viviparity evolved many times uh, in sharks and in, 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 uh, in, uh, in lizards and in, in skinks in, in, in particular. Um, but, in particular, mammalian pregnancy is not that trivial um, because if you think of what happens during the, at the beginning of pregnancy, and with the implantation, the main action of the fetus is to destroy part of the maternal tissue, right? And if that is happening, that is actually uh, quite uh, uh, special for uh, human, uh, human uh, mammalian or eutherian uh, pregnancy because all the other cases of viviparity and placentation that I know of never have invasive placentation, right? There's always superficial. So if we think about mem uh, 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 mammalian uh, in, uh, implantation and think about how this can evolve, uh, you know, you have the first uh, embryo that starts attacking the, 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 the uterus of the mother. Uh, the consequence should be uh, inflammation in the uterus, uh, the recruitment of neutrophils, and the destruction of the embryo because neutrophils, when they are left loose, they destroy just whatever is in their way. Just a few words about inflammation. Uh, inflammation is usually uh, thought of in the context of wounding and uh, infection, uh, but uh, that's not uh, 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 the only way how you get uh, uh, inflammation. You only can think of, you know, if you sprain your ankle, you get uh, inflammation in your uh, injured ankle without any, uh, 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 without any uh, uh, infection. And in fact, it is uh, recognized that infection is only one way how you how in inflammations get, uh, get triggered, the tissue injury or physiological stress uh, are others. And I think uh, in the case of impl uh, implantation, uh, tissue injury would be the way how you get uh, inflammation. So this is what we, uh, um, uh, my collaborators and I called uh, recently the inflammation paradox. Namely uh, that you know, if you evolve 
uh, this intimate relationship between the mother and the, and, and the fetus, uh, inflammation should make it impossible, right? So the question is, uh, can we substantiate this uh, way of thinking in a way, are there uh, mammals or uh, any animals where inflammation limits pregnancy? And we actually found an example uh, by looking uh, outside of uh, placental mammals as a placental marsupials monotremes, and I don't need to explain in a museum, uh, the phylo phylogeny of mammals as I have to do with most of my colleagues otherwise. And of course we uh, looked at uh, marsupials which are the closest primitive grade of organization in, uh, in, uh, and is therefore really rep representative for the ancestral condition that probably also gave uh, a rise to the uh, eutherians. Okay, so what do we know about uh, opossum pregnancy? It's relatively short. 14 days gives rise to uh, neonates, neonates that are really, really uh, immature. Uh, and the placentation is uh, superficial. Here's the placenta, here's the uterine epithelium. It's just an, uh, an, an, an attachment. And as I said, the neonates are extremely immature. Uh, they don't even have a hind limb part. Right, they only have four limbs, no hind limb, but they are really sort of half embryos, really. Um, and uh, as opposed to some neonates in, uh, in, in eutherians, you can't, that can be fairly mature uh, in the end. Okay, so if you look at the fetal maternal interface uh, of the uh, monodelphys, uh, it was actually quite interesting to see that actually up to so uh, 14 days of pregnancy, up to 11.5 or 12. Uh, days of uh, pregnancy, the uterine epithelium here is separated from the placenta or the trophoblast here by an eggshell coat. So out of the 14 days of pregnancy, 12 days roughly, the fetus and the mother actually don't interact in any direct physical way, okay? Which is very different. So I mean, in, in the case of, uh, of, of, of a mouse, it is after four days the contact is established and, uh, and, 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 and implantation uh, happens. And then after uh, 12 days, late in 12 days, then there's a true uh, attachment of the uterine epithelium, the trophoblast, and then you know, it goes on uh, from there. And at day 14, there is a birth. So only two days roughly, there is actually a direct physical contact between the fetus and the, and, and the mother. So this is summarizing it here. So we have uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the blastocyst surrounded by some kind of uh, shell that then is hatching and then attachment is roughly at uh, day 12.5 and then birth is at day uh, 14. So then we were interested what's actually happening in the uterus uh, during that time and I'm only focusing on the contrast between gene expression before attachment and after attachment. That's work by Oliver Griffith, who used to be in my uh, lab. <coughs> it's now in Australia back. And what we found is uh, that the genes that get upregulated in the uterus, if you take, take whole uterus transcriptomes, uh, there's a huge overrepresentation of cytokine biosynthesis, immune response, inflammatory response, and so on. So here you see some of those genes um, uh, in the finer time scale. Uh, COX-2, which is the enzyme that is inhibited by ibuprofen and other non-steroid uh, uh, anti-inflammatory uh, drugs, gets hugely progressively turned on after attachment. Interleukin-6, which is one of the first uh, signals for inflammation, uh, tumor necrosis factor alpha, TNF, uh, is the same. We also have not only uh, the, the RNA uh, that we knew, also the Interestingly, the COX-2 um, uh, protein gets expressed and we also find uh, prostaglandin E2 uh, in the uterus uh, expressed itself. So it's not only the RNA swimming around, it's actually making uh, true inflammatory uh, signals. And uh, most importantly later for us also a, a key uh, cytokine called interleukin-17 is also hugely upregulated after uh, implantation or attachment is actually happening. And that IL-17 is important because it is uh, the product of so-called uh, TH17 cells, 
which then signal to, in particular, uh, uh, endothelial cells that then produce other factors then leads to the uh, 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 re recruitment of neutrophils. And the neutrophils, remember, are the ones that make all the havoc if, if they are there. And in fact, we do find them in the uh, endometrium of uh, day 14, just before birth, uh, the recruitment of, uh, of, of neutrophils in the uterus of, the, of, um, of, of a possum. So, but why would there be this, all this inflammation? Why, what's, what's going on there? Uh, I think uh, the answer is relatively simple, and that is that you know, the early uh, blastocyst surrounded by some kind of a shell, either the zona pellucida and eutherians, or a shell called in, uh, marsupials, and they are hatching out of this shell by secreting proteases that you know, break down uh, 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 proteins. And then, interestingly, after they have uh, hatched out, they continue to express uh, these uh, proteases. So they use proteases to get out of the shell, but instead of stopping producing them, they continue to produce proteases while they are attaching to the uh, uh, maternal tissue. And probably that's the reason why uh, the mother gets so irritated that it activa she activates the, the inflammatory response uh, uh, to it, which in these animals is a normal part of their uh, uh, reproductive uh, cycle. So that led us to a model of the evolution of uh, eutherian uh, pregnancy where we think that what we see in opossum is probably uh, ancestral, there's a pre-attachment phase, then an attachment leading to inflammation, and the inflammation directly leads to parturition, which is basically a reaction to extrude what is irritating the, 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 uh, the, the mucous uh, membranes, similar like diarrhea in a way, right? Um, and, uh, Eutherian uh, pregnancy, like say human, for instance, we think evolved by the inno an innovation of the ability to downregulate the attachment caused inflammation and then create an anti inflammatory environment that allows the extension of pregnancy as long as we know it, for instance, nine months in humans and whatever, two years in, 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 in elephants. And that was, I think, is impossible for a marsupial uh, if they don't evolve a way of dealing with the consequences of, uh, of attachment-induced inflammation. Um, so do, and this is actually uh, consistent with what uh, gynecologists uh, knew for, and obstetricians knew for a long time, namely that at the beginning of pregnancy, we have a phase of uh, pregnancy that is dominated by some kinds of inflammatory processes then we have the second, that's probably also the reason for, um, for morning sickness. There's at least one theory that explains why we have morning sickness, because the inflammatory processes in the uterus uh, uh, communicate to the rest of the body, leading to nausea and so on. Uh, and then the sort of the, 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 the nice uh, part of pregnancy, the second trimester of growth and, and sort of a truce between the, uh, the mother and, and, and the fetus is then the an anti-inflammatory uh, uh, phase, and then towards the end of uh, pregnancy, uh, what's happening essentially is that this anti-inflammatory support for keeping the, 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 the fetus gets withdrawn, and the uh, uh, run up to parturition, and parturition itself is again an inflammatory uh, process where the uterus gets invaded by neutrophils and uh, macrophages and so on. Okay, so <clears throat> if you look at, uh, uh, so we have now these early phases where we have these uh, inflammatory uh, processes, and if we compare, let's say, opossum with uh, what we know from um, other, uh, from Eutherian species, there are many of the uh, inflammatory signals are shared, except the expression of IL-17 and neutrophil uh, 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 recruitment. That's we only see in opossum, but not in sheep, pig, mouse, armadillo, hyrax that we have uh, worked on. So how did this happen? So the main thing here is that probably Eutherian's uh, pregnancy was only possible for, even though it, it's a good idea from a functional point of view, but in actually realizing it with cells and organisms uh, in, the, in, in the body of, an, of, of, of a female, 
they had to evolve a mechanism to suppress the uh, IL-17 uh, um, uh, secretion and thereby the uh, recruitment of, of neutrophils. Now, to make a long story uh, a little bit shorter, uh, uh, we think what's happening is that actually with the evolution of eutherians, a new cell type evolved. It's called the decidual cell that you see here in the histological section, which uh, ontogenetically develops from the endometrial stromal fibroblasts that also exist in uh, marsupials, but these cells cannot decidualize. So it is the origin of the, our suspicion is that the evolution of this cell was the one that enabled uh, extended uh, uh, pregnancy because that contributed to creating this anti-inflammatory uh, signal. And this was then uh, tested by a very talented uh, graduate student of mine, Arun uh, Shavan, and he uh, reasoned that you know, tissue injury probably activates uh, macrophages that then secrete IL-16, that then uh, uh, make naive T cells prevent them to become anti-inflammatory uh, regulatory T cells, T-Rex, but rather uh, polarizes this uh, development of those uh, naive T cells uh, towards the Th17 cells that it then produce IL-17. And his idea was that probably what was evolving was that the deciduous cell uh, evolved a way of inhibiting this uh, transition from a naive T cell to Th17. Uh, so the way he t uh, tested this, he uh, used a, a classical conditioned medium uh, uh, experiment where he used naive T cells, treated them with all these signals that make them into TH17s, but then also added uh, conditioned media from these deciduous cells and then looked at the uh, production of uh, IL-17. And what he found was actually quite pleasing because this is the amount of uh, IL-17 produced in these uh, cells if you just uh, you know, grow them. If you uh, make them into a TH17, you get a twofold increase roughly, or somewhat uh, 1.7 or whatever it is, of IL-17. If you do fresh uh, <coughs> decidualization media, it doesn't change much. If you take uh, 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 conditioned media, you actually basically shut off the uh, production of, of, of IL-17. So the decidual cell that originated in the evolution of, uh, of eutherians are also the cells that prevent the recruitment of, of neutrophils and thereby enable extension of pregnancy to the uh, long uh, 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 you know, time that we now know exists or can be realized in uh, eutherian. So this is just the, the model. So you have attachment and inflammatory signals that start with IL-1 TNF uh, signaling and then all kinds of stuff is happening. And then part of the inflammatory reaction is actually good for the embryo, namely angiogenesis, vascular permeability, edema. That's actually good for it because it in enhances the, the nutrient flow from the mother to the, to the fetus. It is only this here that is really the problem. And it's the problem that the, youth, uh, that the marsupials have not been able to solve in, in their evolutionary thing. And it is the evolutionary origin of the deciduous cell that specifically suppresses this part of the inflammatory response that gives us what we now uh, call an uh, implantation reaction, which is essentially sort of a, a, a curtailed inflammatory reaction, keeping the things that are good and taking away the things that are uh, damaging. Again, this sort of fits into uh, Michaela's and my a uh, 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 scheme here that you have blood sensation and implantation as the, uh, as the trait that is beneficial and would be selected, <clears throat> but it can only be selected if the side effects like inflammation can be controlled by a s uh, separate uh, uh, genetic and uh, cell biological pathway that in our opinion comes from the uh, evolution of the deciduous cell. That just uh, <clears throat> sort of explains in a second why that we have this uh, negative uh, consequences that limit gestation length in, uh, in the opossum and sort of mammalian pregnancy as we know it generically as eutherian uh, pregnancy only became uh, possible after a major innovation, namely the innovation of the deciduous cell and therefore the suppression of neutrophil recruitment. So here's my uh, overall summary uh, of all of these uh, uh, examples. I think the more we learn about developmental and cell biology and genomics, 
the more uh, it becomes obvious that this structuralist organismal approach and view of evolution is in, uh, uh, unavoidable, the one that uh, was uh, invented and pioneered by Perry Alberg uh, 30 plus years ago. Uh, thank you for your attention, and uh, I'm happy to take your questions. Well, yes, just to say that I have to raise a little bit more ground of me in order to be modest, because I have had the opportunity to, to meet Bernard and be interested and devoted to carry out science policy in Spain, yes, I had the opportunity to give him a position of research professor, because at this time this was possible, and also to give him the possibility to create something new in an institute of CSIC, which is a class. <laughs> uh, but in any case, these were the times where Spain was just making a strong bet for modernization, at the same time that also for democratization. And that it is to say that Perez has been really a person that has to be a proud for our institution and the person that are working now in this institute, they should feel very, very happy for being here. Thank you.
So I want to thank in my name and all my family, and the organizers, the museum, and the other side of the council to, to organize this meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, for me, it was a, a, an enormous pleasure to be here, uh, forming a team with Maite and, and other people uh, in this museum that, uh, that suffered a an, an perfect change in only uh, three or four years. Emilio was, <laughs> was our our. In this I was, case, the, the I, I, I was not. I was only the person that <coughs> was at the good moment in the right moment. Right. Pere was just. Pere was uh, enormous. Pere, uh, Pere says uh, always that uh, that he has he had the best team around him. Mm -hmm. Then uh, I think is is uh, is a person who who believe that to be with great uh, <coughs> people uh, make more more uh, strong and great to him. Then thank you very much. I'm very, very happy to be here today. Thank you for coming. Para mí la presencia de Pere en el museo, yo llevo en el museo más de 50 años, fue un revulsivo total cambió totalmente el museo y tuvo el acierto de traerse a Carmen Prats que desde el punto de vista museístico lo cambió completamente. Entonces fue un momento de una vitalidad y de una actividad realmente impresionante que tuve la suerte de que me quieran participar en él. Y no tengo más que decir sobre él. Probably on, on that note, uh, I would like to thank you all very much for coming and, and uh, uh, joining um, friends and former colleagues um, to remember Pere, uh, brother, former president of research council, vice, current vice president of research, um, former vice directors, people in, in his team, uh, younger, older colleagues and, and friends. Um, I hope this not only serves to remember Pere and his legacy, the lines of uh, research that he opened up uh, for us and for others, but also serves as a stimulus to try and think uh, in the future, in our future, the museum, Spanish Research Council, science in general, in Spain and in Europe. I think we may have a better future ahead of us if we manage to work for it, uh, otherwise, we cannot expect things simply to be handed out. It's just uh, up to us uh, to fight for it, to work for it, to identify good leaders, good colleagues. Maybe at some point we will be able to uh, find ourselves in a better situation in this museum, uh, in uh, Spanish science altogether. So uh, here's my vote for that, and uh, thank you again. And as I said earlier, if you uh, want to stay on for some wine and some uh, snacks down in the cylinder, you are all welcome to do so. Thank you very much again. <laughs> <laughs>